Pick up your pace, sir. The meeting is about to start. Don't worry. Deacon Kilborn will hold the meeting. Gentlemen, welcome to the Scioto Land Company. The year was 1802, and in Granby, Connecticut, a group of close-knit families looked to move west to better land and opportunity. We are blessed in our journey, gentlemen. God has his hand upon us, surely. Their destination, 700 miles away in the rich soil of the Northwest Territory. No land speculators, gentlemen, only families who want a better life. This is James Kilborn. He is the undisputed leader of the Scioto Land Company. It helps to know that he was a young man with enthusiasms of a young man. He was only 31 when he first got men together to talk about moving west. He had been a hard worker when he was a young man, so his employer offered if he would do a little extra work, he'd pay him by educating him. And so Kilborn was so excited about learning and life. The Griswold family educated Kilborn, taught him millwork, and promoted him to manager of the business. A Griswold son, Ezra, followed Kilborn into the western frontier. Deacon Kilborn, what should we build first? Mr. Griswold, we will build a temporary log cabin, a meeting house, for Sunday service and for daily schooling. Then, we will build our town. All right. <laughs> it was this decision to come to the frontier in a whole group that ensured their success. There's strength in a group. You didn't get any big bargain in terms of buying more land. It was more the skills to form a self-sufficient community. I think it's um, fundamentally American. Uh, having a vision, taking the risks necessary, forming the community and the kind of support and kind of consensus you need. It was a 16-month process. First, James Kilborn and Nathaniel Little had trekked west to find suitable land. Well, Worthington was named for Thomas Worthington. This was politically very smart. He was not only the land agent that uh, Kilburn and Little had dealt with, he was elected one of Ohio's first two senators. So Worthington, the town, was founded in the year that Ohio became the first state in the Northwest Territory. And it's remarkable to note that it was founded a year before any residents actually lived there. The truth of the matter is that whether we're talking about Americans or whether we're talking about humanity in general, we don't reach our dreams by ourselves. The distance was just under 700 miles. 24 families and seven single men came. Most of the families comprised what historians call a kinship network. They were all, in some way, related to each other. You bought maybe 500 or 600 acres, then you draw by lottery so that no one would get a specially better lot than anybody else. I mean, it was just so democratically set out in terms of fairness. This is one of two early maps that we have of Worthington, and perhaps this one has the most information. Um, if you look at the center that's highly uh, described here, you're going to see all of the little town lots and they're surrounding the green that's still a very favorite part of Worthington today. But beyond that, you'll see all of the various names of the early settlers who were buying these pieces of property. So they'd have a house in town and an outlot that they farmed. The church lot and the school lot were two glebes of land that were meant to support each of the institutions, and of course, they were central to the planning of Worthington. And when the people first got here, they wanted a church service immediately. It's our shepherd. It is our job to follow him wherever we go. These candlesticks were brought here by ox cart in 1803, and they are filled with Connecticut sand. And that was a way of the early pioneers wanting to bring a little bit of home with them. James Kilborn served as deacon for St. John's Episcopal Church. 
and their services were not like today. Their services last like three to four hours. So they were ready. In addition to all of his other duties, Kilbourne was an elected officer of the Worthington Militia. The idea was that citizens would be responsible between the ages of 16 and 50, actually, would be responsible for keeping a stand of arms. And so all the men would show up twice a year on the village green, and they were to bring with them their musket or rifle, um, a powder horn, a quarter pound of powder, two spare flints in case the flint on their flintlocks broke, and um, also a bayonet and a belt and a knapsack. The War of 1812 was over almost as soon as it started. Kilbourne lost out on the lucrative military contracts, but he decided to position himself to further Worthington's national interests, so he campaigned and was elected to Congress not once, but twice. Back then, what everybody sees is the village green. Everybody thinks that's the way it always was. Oh, no. It was covered with trees. This was for public use. They pastured their livestock there. The militia came and had their muster days at the, on the public green. So it was a public space in the center of town. An often overlooked fact was that while the Episcopal Church was the first church in Worthington, the Methodists and Presbyterians were not far behind. But neither of those churches experienced the tension St. John's did in 1817. James Kilbourne was simply not available to lead services, what with his many obligations. So the church invited another leader who also served as the head of the Worthington Academy. His name was Philander Chase. He had good theological training. He was quickly elected Episcopal Bishop for Ohio. Chase was a very passionate man, um, a sort of larger-than-life character. I want to thank everyone for inviting me to come out here today. Philander Chase was a powerful man. He soon became presiding bishop of the National Church, and he was instrumental in the education of his nephew, Salmon P. Chase, who would become treasury secretary and an inspiration for the founders of Chase National Bank. He hits upon the idea of founding a college. The college will feed into the seminary. The seminary, of course, then will produce the rectors needed for the new Episcopal churches around the state. However, he decided fairly early on that his students needed to be away from what he called the vice and dissipation of urban life. And you can imagine how urban Worthington was in uh, the 1820s. So that's why he went to England and sought funding from Lord Gambier and Lord Kenyon and established Kenyon College. There is some speculation that Aurora Buttles consulted with Philander Chase over building designs back in Worthington. This is Kenyon Hall at Gambier, built in the Gothic Revival style. Buttles used this style when he built St. John's Episcopal Church. When the church was first built, it ended right at this place of the large arch. It wasn't until the early 1900s that the back part was enlarged. The four big pillars are trunks of black walnut trees. Those pillars are held up by huge boulders from the Olentangy River. It's important to note that Worthington changed rapidly in its first two decades. The founders never wanted a pioneer town. They wanted an enlightened and refined city. I think it's amazing that in two decades, essentially, the, the pioneers of Worthington accomplished what had taken their ancestors in New England two centuries. 